Welcome to our lecture in line and now we're going to do a series on Maxwell's equations. I'm doing this because there were some viewers that wrote in saying please do something about Maxwell's equation because we don't understand them, we can't find any good material on it. And sure enough, Maxwell's equations can be very confusing and very difficult to deal with and especially because they appear in many different forms. So we're going to go through them in a very systematic way starting here with a general introduction to what Maxwell's equations really are. So here I try to put together a definition. So let's read it together and see if we can make sense out of it. So what are Maxwell's equations? Where well, they're a set of mathematical equations that represent electric and magnetic fields. How they affect one another, how they're affected by charges and currents, and how charges and currents are affected by the fields. So that's really what Maxwell's equations are. Maxwell is very smart, really smart, way smarter than I am way smarter than most people today alive. And he was able to look at electricity and magnetism, electric fields, magnetic fields, currents and charges, and put everything together in a form where he was able to explain them mathematically. Also, he was very clever at finding a mathematical way of showing what the speed of light was. Really, really clever. And so I'll get into that in a little bit more detail as we go on with these lectures. So, he put a set of equations together which are now known as Maxwell's equations. We'll go through them in, in, in just a moment. But also I wanted to give you more of an idea of how electric magnetic fields interact with each other. So I put down five statements that will hopefully help us understand Maxwell's equations a little bit more as we look at them. First of all, charges create electric fields. So whenever there's a charge present anywhere, a charge present means there's going to be an electric field around it. Those charges don't have to do anything, just sit there. They can be moved. If charges move, electric fields will move along with them. Electric fields are always going to be present around charges. And since all matter in the universe is made up of charged objects, atoms which have positive charges in the nucleus, negative charges in the electrons, every nucleus, every proton, every electron in the universe, and that's all matter in the universe, has electric fields around them. If you put a whole bunch of charges together, a whole bunch of positive charges, a whole bunch of negative charges, typically we talk about putting a net positive charge or net negative charge together, there'll be a strong electric field around that. Secondly, accelerating charges create ENM waves. So whenever a charge accelerates, so from rest, starts speeding up or from being moving at a fast pace, slowing down, they cause electromagnetic waves. More typically, electromagnetic waves are created by charges moving back and forth in an oscillating fashion, which means they're constantly accelerating and decel decelerating, accelerating and decelerating. So vibrating charges also cause electromagnetic waves, and that's the primary way in which electromagnetic radiation is caused. Thirdly, moving charges or currents create magnetic fields. So whenever you have moving charges, they don't need to be accelerating, they just need to be moving, and moving charges by definition is a current, a current is a set of moving charges, those will create magnetic fields. So magnetic fields can only be created if charges are moving. If charges are not moving, there will not be a magnetic field, but if charges are moving, there will be a magnetic field. Now, when charges move back and forth, the magnetic fields will then over time cancel each other, so actually you want to have movement of the electric charges in a certain direction to cause a magnetic field to exist around them. Fourthly, magnetic fields cause forces to push against charges moving perpendicular to the field. So let's say we have a magnetic field like this, and charges move perpendicular to that field, they will experience a force. The direction of force and all that, well, that's for later for more detail, but at least know that if you have a magnetic field in this direction, and charges move perpendicular to that field, they will experience a force. Now, if the charges move parallel to the field this way, or parallel to the field this way, they will not experience a force. Only if the charges move perpendicular, and if you place charges inside a magnetic field, they will not experience anything until the charges begin to move. Or, if you want to move the magnetic field, then also you will cause, so if the magnetic field moves relative to the charges, then again, you, the charges will feel a force. And finally, electric fields cause forces to push against charges whether or not they're moving or not. So you have an electric field present, you put a charge inside of it, it will begin to move, it will feel a force depending upon the direction of the electric field and the polarity of the charge. So now that we have all that, let's take a look at the basic 
definition of the four equations that we call Maxwell's equations. The first one is called Gauss's law for the electric field. Now Gauss's law says that you have to, if you have some sort of charge present and you can draw a what we call a Gaussian surface around it so let's say we have a charge there and put a spherical imaginary surface around the charge we can then say that the electric field emanating from that surface so being at this distance away from the charge multiply that times the surface area of the Gaussian surface so that's what this integral is it takes the strength of the electric field it takes the area element there and integrates over the whole surface but if we make the surface in such a way that the electric field emanates perpendicular to the surface in all directions then we can simply say that the area of the surface times the strength of the electric field at the point of the surface is going to be equal to the charge that's inside divided by epsilon sub naught which is the permittivity of the space to electric fields so that is the first equation so he was able to correlate the strength of the electric field based upon the distance away from the charge in that equation. Secondly, Gauss's law for magnetism. So what he said there was if you have a magnet, and a magnet is known to always have a north pole and a south pole, and there will be magnetic field lines going from the north pole to the south pole in all directions. Of course, this would be all the way around it, not just in a flat uh, universe, so to speak. All right. Now, if we put a Gaussian surface anywhere where that magnetic field is present due to the presence of a magnet, we can see that all the magnetic flux entering that surface and all the magnetic field, uh, all the magnetic flux leaving that surface will be equal. The total amount of flux entering, the total amount of flux leaving is equal, such that the net flux is always going to be zero, no matter where we put that Gaussian surface. So anywhere we put it, there's always going to be the same amount of flux entering as the same amount of flux leaving. That is never the case for the electric field. Notice that there's, in this case, if we have a positive charge there, electric flux will be leaving and none will be entering. So there's not a net zero flux there. There's actually a real flux there. So this is always equal to the electric flux, where in this case, the electric flux or the magnetic flux, whoop, the magnetic flux, uh, whoop, there we go, that's how we write the magnetic flux. We put a B there for the B field, the magnetic field. You can see that this flux always will be zero because the same amount of flux enters as leaves. The third equation is Faraday's law of induction. There you need a current loop, or actually you don't need a current loop, you actually need a conductor loop. Let's say we have a conductor loop, and let me draw one. Here it is, here's my conductor loop. A continuous loop that allows current to flow if there was current to flow. So there it is. So this has free charges that are just stationary there. Now let's imagine that we have a magnetic field going through the loop like this. For whatever reason, there's a presence of magnetic field. At this point, nothing happens yet. Now, what happens when the flux through the loop changes? That's what the DDT is. There's a change with respect to time in the flux, magnetic flux. Remember that the magnetic flux, by definition, is equal to the, the magnetic field strength times the area of that loop. So if for some reason the magnetic field gets stronger or for some reason the magnetic field gets weaker so that the total flux changes, either increases or decreases, it will cause an electric field to exist inside the conductor and if we integrate the strength of the electric field inside a conductor times the length along that conductor that's what the ds is it's just a small little line segment if we then say e dot ds and we integrate it over the whole loop that would be strength of the electric field times the distance around the loop which is actually equal to the voltage created around the loop the emf created around the loop that will then equal the change of the flux, magnetic flux through the loop, or vice versa, the change in magnetic flux in the loop will cause a voltage to exist around the loop, an E field around the loop, which causes an electromotive force to exist, which will then cause charges to run through the loop, which of course, charges run through the loop is current. So you'll create a current by changing the B field strength through the loop. That was Faraday's law of induction. And fourthly, Ampere's law says that if you make a, if you have a current wire like this, let's say that wire is carrying current around it. If you now imagine a circular region around that wire, 
not, not, a, not a Gaussian surface, but a single, like, let's say, a region around the wire, which is basically like a smaller loop going around the wire, there will be a B field or magnetic field around this current carrying wire. And so if we then integrate the strength of the B field at this location times the length of this region, this length of this circle, imaginary circle, that's the integral around the circle of the distance around the circle times the strength of the B field all the way around it. If you integrate that, that will equal to mu sub naught, which is the permeability of the magnetic field in free space, times the current enclosed in the loop. It's kind of interesting. Because what he's saying is, whenever you have a current loop, or I mean, whenever you have a wire with current in it, there will be a magnetic field around it. And the strength of the field is proportional to the current in this fashion. Not only that, he had a second term added to that, where we added to that mu sub naught, epsilon sub naught, which is the, permittivity of free, uh, the permeability of free space, the permittivity of free space, times the time change of E dot dA. Now this E dot dA right here is the same as the E dot dA right there. Really what that says is, if you, have a, if you have a change in the electric field times the dA, which is really the flux of the electric field. So what they're saying is, if there's a change in the electric flux in this region, that will also cause a magnetic field to exist. So if an electric field and it changes in strength, that's what this means, the change in the flux of the electric field, it changes in strength, it will also cause a magnetic field to exist. So magnetic fields are created by currents, and magnetic fields are created by the change in the electric field. And this is the, these are the four equations that now describes the, what we would call Maxwell's equation, what describes the electric fields, the magnetic fields, and how they interact with each other. Now, this lecture right here is very top level, and may not have really given you a full understanding of those. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take each one of those separately and talk about them in a little bit more detail so you can understand how they work and what they mean, and then we're also going to show you Maxwell's equations in different forms with the divergence and the curl and so forth. So in differential form, in integral form, and so forth, to get a full picture of what the, what the Maxwell's equations really mean and how we can use them. And there's our introduction to something that's a little complicated, but one step by step we'll get through it and you'll understand what it all means.